you are. I'm Vince Cerf. I'm Google's chief internet evangelist and chairman of the Marconi Society. The Marconi Society is a nearly 50 year old nonprofit with a vision for a connected world where information and communications technologies empower everyone to reach their full potential. Our programs and awards are, celebrate innovators in our field and support national progress towards digital equity. Please visit us at www.marconisociety.org to learn more about our work and to consider supporting our worthy programs. Today's events honor our 2022 Marconi Fellow, Siavash Shalamuti. Every year, the Marconi Society recognizes a true leader in the field who has created technology that has significantly moved our connected world forward. The Marconi Prize has been called the Nobel Prize of Communications, and we are pleased to honor Siavash this year. Through his innovations in wireless technology, Siavash has impacted billions of people on the planet by making mobile phones less expensive, better performing, and greener. You'll have the opportunity to hear Siavash's perspectives in a few panels over the next two days. With nearly half the world unconnected and 42 billion in broadband infrastructure funding going out to the states in the US right now, Digital equity is center stage in the journey to social equity. This is the backdrop of our symposium, the decade of digital inclusion. Our purpose today and tomorrow is to bring together technologists, policymakers, and digital inclusion practitioners to create collaborations for bringing the next billion people online. Only by working together can we create the scale and the impact that we need? You'll hear from and be able to ask questions of leaders in business, academia, public policy, and philanthropies. We will address a range of critical topics, including how we measure our progress towards digital equity, sustainable funding for digital inclusion, how we spend $42 billion in infrastructure funding with digital equity in mind, and more. We would like to thank our partners for this event, the Institute for Business and Social Impact at Berkeley Haas and the Center for Effective Global Action also here at UC Berkeley. Many thanks also to our sponsors who have made this event possible. Thanks also to the Internet Society who is live streaming our event around the world. Mostly, thank you to the speakers, the panelists and the moderators at the heart of this event. Feel free to share information as the event is happening by using the hashtag DODI22. Call out the Marconi Society at Marconi Society and we'll engage with you. I'm excited to get started in conversation with my friend and colleague, Shamina Singh from the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Arthur Franco will moderate our discussions. Arturo is the Senior Vice President of Thought Leadership for MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. You could say, uh, I, I think that I've been working with this uh, center for some time now, and it seems so central to the idea of linking technologies like the internet and the World Wide Web to our econ economic welfare. And certainly MasterCard has been at the heart of that. Arturo's background includes time at the McKinsey and Company as a senior advisor and, and in an executive position with the state of Nuevo Leon and as a World Economic Forum Fellow for Latin America. Arturo, thanks so much for leading Shamina and me through this exciting conversation. Thank you, uh, Vint, and, and thank you for the invitation to the Marconi Society and your other partners. Um, as you very well said, uh, we believe at the center that building an inclusive and sustainable digital economy is a cornerstone for peace, for prosperity, and for progress. And the big question that uh, you are asking today is, can we, in the next decade, really fulfill the promise of this, of this uh, digital inclusion to do things like achieve shared prosperity, 
but also support small businesses, female entrepreneurs, tackle racial inequities, uh, use data uh, to provide insights for local decision makers to improve communities and ultimately deliver positive social impact. Uh, and so I think that that's a great framing for this kickoff conversation uh, with you. By the way, Vint, um, to all of us who know him and love him, uh, have to remind ourselves that he always leaves out the most, I guess, notable part of his background as considered one of the fathers of the internet in, in, in his uh, humility. But we have to say that, uh, Vint. Uh, as well as being chief evangelist, uh, internet evangelist at Google, uh, chair of the Marconi Society. And I have the pleasure of introducing Shamina Singh, who's a founder uh, and president of the Center for Inclusive Growth at MasterCard. So Shamina, let me start with you. Why don't you please share you know, how the, the Center for Inclusive Growth came about? You've been thinking and talking about this notion of inclusive growth for over a decade before it was you know popular now it's kind of the the age of where everyone's talking about inclusive growth um and how, how does it fit with with this idea of digital equity well thanks to the marconi society and uh to vent for uh including us today and thank you arturo for for joining us as well um i agree with you i think that the center for inclusive growth um was created at a moment in time where as a company, MasterCard was um, starting its financial inclusion journey. Um, the, and the center was really created because we recognized that financial inclusion was sort of in, in some respects a pathway out of poverty, but the notion of inclusive growth was a pathway to shared prosperity. Um, and we also recognized that we were in well, Vint has recognized this for a long time, but for, for those of us who came a little bit later, um, we were at an inflection point in terms of the digital economy. More and more people were going into the digital economy, but not as many people understood how to survive, how to thrive, how to transition. And so the center was uh, created um, as a construct to join together both the uh, business assets of MasterCard, which is, you know, obviously data and data analytics, digital work, the technology network, um, as well as the social impact side of MasterCard, which involved philanthropic capital, research and building an evidence base um, around it, and then subsequently building out um, programs. And so really, uh, Arturo, both you and Vint were on the front foot with the center really helping us build our evidence base around what a digital economy means, what it, uh, what it looks like, what the potential, what the possibility is, and then um, also around quite literally uh, connecting to the digital economy. So uh, we're almost 10 years old, but um, we have wow. still have a lot of more work. Yeah, and so Jamina, let, let me double down a little bit on you. Vint, I'm gonna come back to you uh, to talk about where we are in, in the big kind of scheme of, of digital inclusion you just mentioned. Uh, half of the world still being left out. But at the macro level, Shamina, there's this very clear notion uh, that the internet created economic progress. Uh, like a 10% a of, of penetration of the internet in a country meant a sustained 1% increase in GDP, which is massive if you, if you compound uh, across decades. But but when you look below the headline number, when you when you don't average, you can see that what you just said, a lot of people were left behind. That the benefits went to a part of the economic uh, pyramid and are not broadly shared. So, what is this in your mind interaction between digital inclusion? You mentioned financial inclusion. Let's talk about digital inclusion. And as the title of the session says an economy that's equitable and that works for everyone? I think it's a great question, Arturo. And I think the way that we are thinking about it really relates to this notion that there are, you know, there's, there's the binary of connected or not, but there's also this continuum of connection to the digital economy. And that's also where, uh, you know, you sort of, in some respects, move a little bit beyond the technology of it to the actual um, access and usage and growth in the digital economy. And that's the intersection. So the technology is certainly there. And, you know, we, we will talk about, you know, the 
mobile phones and sort of all of the enablers, but it's also this notion of capacity building around the digital economy. And I think that's a, pl a place where you get into the economic development, the notion of inclusive growth, the notion of equitable access and um, prosperity in a digital economy. So it's sort of, I think, moving beyond um, the binary of connected or not to a more expansive approach to thinking about what are the, uh, what's the continuum of connection and then what does it really mean to uh, build capacity uh, for organizations and for people to succeed in a digital economy. Thank you, Jimena. Vint, let me turn to you. Um... You were clearly and obviously one of the first people in the world to think about digital inclusion and internet inclusion. Um, you were, you know, early in uh, in, in thinking about that. Um, I remember celebrating with you in Palo Alto and with Tim Berners-Lee and other uh, internet uh, kind of uh, founders um, when the world reached uh, 50%, maybe three three years ago. Where where is the state of digital inclusion in 2022, and and what are your kind of main sources of optimism and main sources of of concern on where we are uh, today? And you, I think you're on mute, Vin, but we can get you. There we go. Yeah, you know, I'm being very polite, trying not to interfere with anything that Shamina says, and so I'm uh, forgetting to unmute myself like everybody else. Uh, well, first of all, you know, the, your question is a little bit like asking someone to describe the universe in 25 words or less and give three examples. Uh, I will say that it's inescapable at this point that uh, everyone is in a digital economy, whether they like it or not. I mean, they are, they really are part, that's the way our economy works increasingly. And certainly as the MasterCard will know, because it's a core component of the financial sector, uh, that uh, the financial sector has been digital for quite a long time now and increasingly so, especially as we move away from cash kinds of transactions to electronic transactions of one kind or another. Uh, so everyone, in some sense, is uh, living in this digital economy. And of course, we would like them all, as you say, to thrive in that economy. Uh, being uh, able to get access to the Internet may be part of that story. But even if you're not accessing the Internet, you're still influenced by other people who are using it to operate their businesses. So as I think more and more about this, um, I think of, of uh, MasterCard and its ability to observe the transactions that are taking place uh, using uh, MasterCard facilities. And in a very funny way, it's almost like uh, a thermometer uh, that lets you judge uh, economic activity. But it's a very refined uh, thermometer because you can see the range of economic activity that's taking place. You know where it is, you know when it is, you know what kinds of transactions, what purchases are being made. And it gives you a better sense of what's happening in the digital economy than we might otherwise have. And so one of the most valuable things about the Center for Inclusion and Inclusive Growth is that it can use that insight that it's gaining uh, from, uh, from those observations to understand where uh, improvement can be made. In the case of internet access, we think that the uh, relative percentage of access now is on the order of 68 to 65%, but that still leaves 35% of the world without access. And the 65% that do have access may not have access that's adequate for uh, or fit for purpose for all the kinds of things we know we can do, including this kind of a conference call. So there's still more to be done, both to provide access where it isn't and improve access where it isn't either stable or affordable or uh, reliable or fast enough or rapid enough or, or uh, low enough latency for various and sundry applications. So we're still some distance from getting everybody up and online and I think we're also discovering, uh, as we might chat about later, the uh, lessons from the pandemic tell us a lot about who can and who cannot make best use of uh, online resources. And so we're still, despite the fact that the Internet is now almost 50 years old, uh, at least in concept, um, it's still exploring 
the possibilities. I'm going to do a, a shameless plug here, but part of the work of the of the center uh, at Mastercard is precisely what you mentioned: take, taking that uh, anonymous and aggregated data that we have on on, on spend, right, um, and trying to um, make it useful for decision makers in in the real world, in communities, in cities. Uh, we've done this through the creation of tools like the Inclusive Growth Score, or through connecting with researchers. Um, and I think it's something, you know, people call it data for good, but I think it's something that many private sector companies, including, um, you know, Google with Google.org uh, should be doing. It's it's a way to contribute uh, back to society. And so let me ask you a broader question. You you mentioned, obviously, the massive broadband, broadband spending that is uh, about to happen or happening in the United States. And obviously the government is playing a massive role in getting the internet to everyone. But when you look at the private sector in your experience, uh, both at Google, but also having been one of our first data fellows at the, at the Center for Inclusive Growth, what is the role that the private sector should play in digital inclusion and equity? Well, the prime, I'm sorry, go ahead. The, the private sector uh, really has uh, an opportunity before it when you think about uh, business and you think about the fact that it only works because people are uh, looking to buy uh, services or buy goods and so on, they're part of the economy. The private sector offers those opportunities. It also offers work. And in a sense, these things don't happen unless there is work to be done, uh, earnings to be made, uh, and uh, investment uh, to be uh, I would investment risks to be taken and returns to be obtained. And the consequence of all that is that all the various pieces have to fit together. At this point, I think we're seeing um, increasing opportunity for people to make a living in a different way than they have in the past. Uh, we certainly watched a dramatic uh, change in India, for instance, as they began to invest in information technology and the provision of services not only domestically, but on an international scale. And I like to think that the internet offers an opportunity for all countries to take advantage of the global economy in addition to a domestic one in order to improve everyone's well-being. So the opportunity to, uh, to take digital inclusion and turn it into something that is beneficial for everyone seems to me a big opportunity that we should all be attentive to, including and especially the private sector, but I hope you'll note that the private sector can't take advantage of these things and make its contributions available unless government policies create a framework in which it's possible for that to happen. Competition is important. The ease with which new businesses can be created, startups and the like are all the font from which new work uh, arises. And I think this too needs to be kept in mind as we try to shape our policies towards improved economic circumstances for everyone. Completely agree with you, Vin. Some questions are starting to trickle in on the Q&A, so please uh, keep them coming. I have a couple more, uh, one for Shamina. Um, Shamina, as we look at uh, this, this path towards full digital inclusion, the numbers that Vin had just shared with us globally, but also in the United States, um, how are companies like MasterCard perhaps more focused on the digital financial space, but how are you thinking more broadly about the challenge of full digital uh, inclusion? Um, well, I just, I'm smiling because I um, so appreciate Vince's uh, uh, commentary on the internet and in terms of the, uh, the potential, its ability to unlock potential. Um, that's really the way that we also view the world, you know, at the center. But it's interesting because, you know, as Vint, as you've, if you've talked to me about this, it's also, um, it's almost a little bit of a, maybe not neutral platform, but I think what's crystallizing for me is that, you know, the internet is, is, is blank space in some respects. And, you know, private sector has a role to play, social sector has a role to play, philanthropy has a role to play, things like that. And it's almost like we're trying to, uh, you know, ensure that at least at the center, we're trying to ensure that the benefits that you describe 
about the internet are shared more equitably around the world and that more people can take advantage of this wonderful technology called the internet. And, um, and the frameworks and the guidelines are there, because I think, because everybody's motivation isn't the same. So some are using the internet in, a, in different ways to maybe not take advantage of people's best intentions, but sometimes of people's worst intentions. And so to the extent that private sector actors, I think, can be involved to also help ensure that the internet is used for its best and highest good, and that is, as Mint describes, um, for more people in, in service of people in the planet. And I think that um, at the center, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And that takes the shape of, you know, building the evidence base and the research and the, you know, and the investments we're making around that, um, creating the conditions that uh, allow for more people to take advantage of um, the internet. But it's also about, um, I think, uh, this, this idea of not only building capacity, but this idea that, you know, with usage comes action. And so what we're also trying to do, and I think, Arthur, this gets to your, your question around, you know, sort of where we see this, what we learned very clearly from financial inclusion was that, you know, financial education in and of itself is not very effective. Uh, people, of course, want to understand how to do better budgeting and how to understand how money works and things like that. But it's really only when they're provided a use case do they actually really pay attention because there's a lot of things that people have to spend their time doing. And so like the internet and like digital technology, we are trying to provide use cases that are so beneficial and so essential to people's lives and livelihoods that it, it incentivizes them to take action. And I'll just give you an example of that. Um, you know, uh, wage dig digitization is an incredibly useful application of digital technology um, and the internet. Currently, most people in developing countries who may be working in a gar as garment workers in factories are paid in cash. And so, Vint, you mentioned this earlier in terms of MasterCard having a very specific um, uh, tool around uh, displacing cash, and that is digital payment. What we're finding is that if you can digitize somebody's payment, their paycheck, then it allows, especially women, to save in a way that they just weren't able to do before. And so women, you know, garment workers in factories making clothes, you know, in Cambodia and Vietnam and things like that, they're no different from any of us. They want to save, they want to raise their families, they want to have, you know, beautiful lives. But if they're, you know, if they're paid in cash, if they don't have a use case for the digitization in a way that actually makes sense to them, they have a lot of other things they're going to spend their time doing. And so this very simple notion of creating an opportunity for somebody to be paid digitally where it goes straight into a bank account and you can keep the money digital with by using it at a shop that also accepts digital payment, allows women and allows others to save in a way that they didn't have access to before and also plan their um, financial experience. But the bigger point is, uh, you know, is to sort of say that without use cases that um, incentivize or really show the power of what this technology can do, it's much harder to incentivize, I think, um, uh, people to actually make the leap or take the steps to really uh, reach their potential in a digital economy. So Arturo, I'm gonna jump in here because I want to uh, amplify something that Shamina said. Uh, the use case uh, is an example of learning by doing, basically. And it's amazing how powerful that is. And just by analogy, uh, one of the things that I've observed about the YouTube um, product is that a lot of people go there to find out how to do X for some value of X, whatever that is. It could be a financial transaction that you're wondering about how to conduct. Uh, but often it's uh, things like, uh, well, in my case, my wife and I decided we wanted to make Chinese eggplant. We didn't know how to do that. We went to YouTube. We said, how do you make Chinese eggplant? And we got 17 videos that told us how to do that. And of course, we discovered that the Chinese eggplant is this long, skinny, gray thing instead of this big, fat, dark, black thing. 
and, uh, and we made a fairly credible uh, Chinese eggplant, but we wouldn't have been able to understand any of that if we hadn't actually tried to do it. So I love the idea of having uh, people learn by doing something or ask to learn when they need to do it, uh, you know, right now, because uh, the, uh, the depth of learning you get from needing to do it right now, as opposed to, well, maybe someday I'll have to use this information is much more powerful. Uh, it, it's uh, easier to retain. So I'm a big fan of, uh, of learning by doing, and I'm glad to see that that's part of your story. And thank you, Vint, for that. I also use YouTube for all kinds of things. I was using it to know how to carve a pumpkin the other day. Um, but I, I'm really <laughs> glad you're getting very specific use cases. Uh, there's a question in the chat about, uh, Shamina, what kinds of questions we are researching at the center, which we can get to at the end. But I wanted to go back to your, the point that you made, Shamina, in the last uh, intervention about you know, the elephant in the room, which is the internet has been great for so many things. The internet has also been blamed for not uh, so positive things, right? Um, and the pandemic um, over the last years, as we all know, was not just a massive accelerator of digital inclusion, but perhaps uh, the most pure experiment of our lives on, on the web, like our, our digital lives. And as Bhaskar Chakraborty likes to say, uh, the internet passed the test, but humans failed. Um, we, we saw you know, kids being educated. We saw people continuing to uh, connect with doctors. We use the internet for all kinds of positive things, but we also see, saw misinformation, you know, social um, debate, et cetera, that, that was not as positive. So Vint, I wanna go to you as you've been following the growth of our digital lives and you were living through the pandemic and the internet was probably saving our life in many ways. How did that make you feel? Um, both about the positives of the internet, but also, you know, about, uh, about the negatives. Well, so the pandemic has certainly taught us a number of lessons, uh, and I hope that we uh, retain those and apply them. The first thing that it taught us is that it's possible to work remotely, even though I think there was great suspicion in the private sector that this was actually feasible. Uh, so many of us were able to work from home uh, because our jobs permitted that, the kind of work that we did permitted that. But not everyone's work can be done remotely. And so one of the most important uh, indications coming out of the pandemic experience is that uh, our supply chain system is potentially fragile, especially if it depended on proximity for some people to do their work to make the supply chain complete. And so if you could not do work except on the spot, uh, then you were in trouble if, if you were staying away because of the pandemic risks. So we learned that there was fragmentation uh, and also a significant distinction among people who could work at home or work from home and people who could not. The second thing we learned is that uh, you could do education remotely, but uh, many of the schools were not, and teachers were really not either prepared or equipped uh, to uh, conduct their, uh, their lessons that way. Universities were probably closer to it because more of them were edging towards remote education. For example, uh, Georgia Tech has an amazing master's degree program that uh, one of our board members, Zavika Lowell, is responsible for having created. And that turns out to have been extremely successful. But if you get into the elementary schools and the secondary schools, you find that they were much less prepared. Maybe the local uh, internet uh, capacity of the school wasn't sufficient to do the kind of broadcasting needed. So all of that was uh, tells us that we still need more infrastructure development to take advantage of that mode uh, of operation. I will also, I wanted to mention one other thing, uh, aside from the pandemic, which of course continues to be a great concern, we have had many major natural disasters that have occurred, especially hurricanes, for example, in Puerto Rico and other parts of the Caribbean. And the reason I wanted to bring that up is that once again, looking at the ability of MasterCard to sense economic activity is a way for us to judge recovery rates 
in the areas that have been affected by a major disaster. Because when you start to see economic activity, it tells you that, you know, it gives you a measure of how the recovery uh, from, uh, from whatever has been damaged. So uh, this whole idea of, of using uh, digital technology as a sensor system uh, is important. And this is important from the government point of view, getting adequate information in order to make policy decisions is really important. So for example, what about the state of medical care? What is the state of health for our population? On, on the basis of that information, what policy decisions should the government take? And once again, digital information is a way of uh, both gathering and then uh, exposing to analysis the information that's been obtained in order to guide policy decisions. And so we, I just have this feeling that this increased digitization is really a, a, a great potential benefit when it comes to policy development. And, uh, you know, we, we completely agree with you at the center. We have been working um, for the last three or four years with the Rockefeller Foundation on building uh, this field that you're just describing of, of how to use data, particularly high frequency granular data to amplify the resolution, not just of the public sector, but also of the social sector, which has been lagging uh, behind in both uh, capacity and ability to attract talent uh, to do data work. We call it impact data science. Uh, just, you know, an analogy to impact investing. Mm -hmm. So maybe, I mean, I wanted to bring you in maybe to get a little bit more specific on some of the initiatives that the center is working on, either on impact data science or um, more broadly on digital inclusion that, that maybe the people who are listening can can go and search and, and get more informed on. Are there any examples that, that come to mind of the work uh, that you're doing? Yeah, and I think it's uh, related to both of your points, Vin. I think, you know, once again, you hit the nail on the head. The digital, the digitization and the di and whether it's natural disaster or anything else has essentially created much more data. And so, um, but the problem is that it's also created a world of data haves and data have nots. And what we're trying to do with the program that Arturo describes, and as, as you sort of led the charge as one of our first data science fellows, is to really bridge what we call an information inequality gap. And so we hear a lot about income inequality, um, but this notion now with digitization that's created so much more data, we actually feel like we're at this moment, Vint, that um, you probably experienced uh, early on in the, in the evolution of the internet where every social sector organization, indeed every person on the planet is going to have to figure out what their, uh, Data, what their data analytics footprint is. So in the same way that a nonprofit didn't probably know in the early 90s that they were going to need to have a URL and a website and a digital uh, media channel and all this other stuff in order to do their work even better, we think that's the same thing happening now with data and data analytics, that every social sector organization, every, um, every person it really is going to need to understand their role and the purpose of data in their lives. And that's what the work of the impact data science uh, is trying to do is actually create a field of data science for social impact to take advantage of all of the, of all of the data now that this digitization has provided, but ensure that we really don't um, miss the mark when it comes to information inequality. And I think that uh, in terms of particular programs, um, Arturo mentioned, you know, we have a program going at Tufts called, called Idea 2030, where they're doing a lot of research on the digital economy. And so that's one place I would definitely recommend people go. I think a second place is also data.org, because that is a, that's a new institution we're actually, we've created in partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation to realize the power of data in the social sector economy. And I guess the, and the third, obviously, would be to please, you know, have a look at the Center for Inclusive Growth um, website and materials, because I do think, you know, the more people, the more listeners, the more, you know, engagement we can have from, from technologists, practitioners, academics, real leaders that I think the Marconi Society um, attracts, I think the better off uh, we will be in our quest to ensure that something as powerful as the Internet actually does do what Vin intended it to do, which is help people realize their full potential. So, uh, 
No, Dr. Ahmed. Sorry, to, uh, you know, I, I, every time I hear Shamina say anything, it, it inspires all kinds of thinking. Uh, so I'm thinking about measurement for just a second. Uh, and we, we've talked about financial health and your ability to kind of measure that. And we notice that it's not uniform. I mean, you know, the, the health, financial health is, varies dramatically from place to place. But we need to know and understand how to map that. Uh, the same thing is true for internet. Internet's health is, in a sense, also important. How well does it work? How reliable is it? Uh, does it run with the right parameters? So one of the things that the Marconi Society is interested in doing is learning how to measure internet's performance more accurately and, and more continuously uh, over periods of time so we can see whether it's improving or not or know where we should be spending those $42 billion here in the States. The same argument can be made for medical health. Again, it's not uniformly distributed and understanding uh, where people are or are not healthy and why uh, could turn out to be very, very important for policymaking. Uh, so this leads me to speculate that having available uh, what we'll call public data commons, that is a collections of information that is public avail of publicly available to everyone for purposes of uh, allowing analysis could be really important, not only for government policymaking, but think about the private sector trying to understand what's happening in the markets of the world. And so having that data available for data science and analytics to be applied is really valuable. And I hope that uh, your company and mine and others will contribute to uh, publicly available information to improve our decision making. I know Arturo is going to go here, but I'm just going to jump in to say that, you know, to your first point in terms of measuring the temperature, measuring the, the availability of service, we have a program going called the Internet Equity Initiative with um, the University of Chicago, where we're measuring the Internet's health, if you will, um, across uh, across Chicago right now, but it, it could expand. But really finding the intersections, as no one will be surprised, that you know, in places that have lower income, lower employment rates, um, sometimes by, you know, obviously by by race uh, and gender, um, the internet is working less well. And so, but mapping it through this internet equity initiative, I think will provide at least as you described earlier, Vint, policymakers with a tool that they can actually talk about the analysis in such a way that is giving them that evidence base that they need to maybe make decisions. So, um, but Arturo, over to over to you. No, so, I was going to mention. Right, I, go sorry, ahead. Arturo, I keep doing this to you, but I can't resist. Um, it, it, I'm just thinking about the other thing that we need to measure, and that's, of course, current state of uh, climate uh, in the world and all the you know the consequences of uh, climate change. And once again, and for cities, you know, instrumenting the cities to understand how well are our, are our cities operating, we have this enormous opportunity to measure, capture, analyze, and improve based on uh, our ability to uh, see what's going on by uh, suitable instrumentation. So it's just amazing what the implications of digitization really are. Sorry, Arturo, go ahead. Oh, no, that's a perfect segue. I, there, there was actually a question about climate change. I was going to say, additionally to the uh, University of Chicago project on internet equity, the uh, Digital Planet staff at Tufts University created a, a mapping of US states called the uneven state of the nation, which I would also uh, invite people to go and check out. It, it is about the, the internet. We have only two minutes left, um, so I will I will wrap it up. But uh, I would say, Vint, that, that to kind of that idea of, of how to combine public um, and private uh, and other sources of data to answer critical questions about some of the most uh, challenging aspects of, of society. Uh, what is working really well is going uh, into, you know, thematic uh, kind of vertical. So we're working, for example, through data.org on pandemic prevention and how, how to kind of connect the data pipes and the data owners around uh, future potential pandemics. That's it's a project called the Epiverse. Uh, and just like that, we could imagine a similar one on climate change or on financial inclusion. And so uh, by choosing areas of, of interest, of common interest, and analyzing the data gaps and, you know, the, um, the willingness of private and public sector um, data providers to share, 
uh, I think that we could tackle part of the of the problem that you were just describing. So with that, thank you so much to both of uh, you, Shamina. Great to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. Uh, Vint, uh, again, it's always a pleasure to talk uh, to you and congratulations on this great event with the Marconi Society. Congratulations on a great event. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks so much, Shamina. Thank you, Arturo. We'll see you on the net.